And this is one of the reasons why we welcome all of our virtual members out there who are listening or watching us. Somebody out there, out there in your world, referred someone in this world to come into these walls this past Sunday. So thank you, our virtual members. We're glad that you are listening to us. Hopefully today's sermon will uh, help clear some things up for you from the past few weeks. And for all of us here, that is our hope this morning. We are struggling along with this sermon series, as Steve has told you each and every week, and uh, supposedly it's my job to come in here and clear everything up. Don't know if that's going to happen this morning, but I will make my best try. Our scripture text this morning comes from Genesis chapter 32, starting in verse 24. But Jacob stayed behind by himself, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he couldn't get the best of Jacob as they wrestled, he deliberately threw Jacob's hip out of joint, and the man said, Let me go. It's daybreak. Jacob said, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. The man said, What's your name? And he answered, Jacob. The man said, But no longer. Your name is no longer Jacob. From now on, it's Israel, God wrestler. You've wrestled with God. And you've come through. And Jacob asked, And what's your name? And the man said, Why do you want to know my name? And then, right then and there, he blessed him. And Jacob named the place, let's make this up, Peniel. Does that work for y'all? Peniel? We have no idea how to pronounce that. God's face. Because he said, I saw God face to face, and I lived to tell the story. And there our text ends. Let's consider how we'll apply these words to our lives this morning. Wrestling with God. Have you ever wrestled with God? Have you ever stared God in the face in a death grip with God? Wondering who would win, wondering if you would get to the other side of the struggle. Have you been there before? Are you a person who is not even sure if you've ever wrestled with God? You are wrestling with something, you're just not sure if you would call that person, that thing, that force on the other side, God. Have you wrestled with your faith? your beliefs, your ideas of who you are, what the world's all about, what the purpose of the universe really is. Here at Columbine United Church, we love the wrestling. We love the struggle. It's all about the fight. Fighting about our beliefs, struggling and wrestling with God, is what Columbine United Church's faith and values are all about. We believe that wrestling is a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's how we get farther along our journey of faith. And so we are doing this sermon series, Puzzled by the Bible, for that very reason. Now, how many of you out there feel puzzled by what you've heard over the past few weeks? Maybe a little confused, a little anxious. How many of you have had your foundations of your faith kind of ripped out from under you as Steve looked at you and said, yeah, that whole Moses Exodus story didn't really happen that way. Some of you were like, who's Moses? Isn't that like Charlton Heston, that guy from the Ten Commandments movie? I think I remember seeing that on... <laughs> this group is made up of two different crowds. You are either of the crowd where you learned about Moses, you learned about the Exodus, you learned about the Bible, and you kind of know the stories, you remember them from Sunday school and church growing up, and Steve ripped out your world over the past few weeks. Or you're the group that come in here and went, I've never cracked open a Bible in my life. I have absolutely no idea what is in there. And basically, whatever you tell me, I'm going to be somewhat okay with that, right? I mean, you're probably in one of those two camps. 
And so on either way, you are confused and puzzled coming into this sermon this morning. So here's the first part that I want you to be very clear about. Christian history has been focused in a really awful way on everyone believing and thinking the same thing. So throughout the centuries, we created creeds and confessions. And in churches all over the country this morning, people all stand up in unison. Many of you have done this before. And you recite the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed and say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. And you go on and on. And everyone recites it in unison, all with its uniform belief. And Christian history has been been about making sure we all have the right things to say and we all believe it in just the right way. And denominations were created because someone said, I don't agree with them anymore. I'm starting my own thing and I'll create my own creed, my own confession. We'll all stand up and say whatever it is that I want everyone to say. And that has been how we all got here. And somewhere along the line, Columbine got formed because three different groups of people who generally say different things all got together and said, we're going to just hang out with one another. So Methodists and Presbyterians and United Church of Christ people all got together with their different creeds or different confessions or different belief statements and said, we're going to be in the same place together and we don't all have to say the same thing. And that is a wonderful thing because that is the Hebrew tradition. That is the Jewish tradition. In the Jewish faith, you fight it out. You duke out your faith. You contend. You struggle with it. You argue voraciously. In the Jewish faith, the idea is I will bring my stuff to the table, you bring your stuff to the table, that person over there will bring their stuff to the table, and we will argue it out, and at the end, we will not agree, but we will be better people for it. We will have better beliefs for it. We will have better faith lives and a better world for the arguing of it. There's a recognition that truth is plural. That truth requires diversity rather than uniformity. That truth cannot be just my opinion all dictated to the crowd. I know something about God, but so do you. I know things about God from my studies and my learning and all the books that are on my bookshelf that y'all come in there and go, have you read all of those? I know a whole bunch of stuff about God from that. But you know what? There is a whole bunch I don't know about God. And there are assumptions I make about God that I shouldn't make. And that's where you all come into my faith and challenge what I believe and what I think. And we argue it out. And we struggle with it. And Columbine United Church is a place where we are we were founded on this principle that three different groups can come together with different ideas and that faith is born out of that rather than somehow limited by it. And so we come to the Hebrew Scriptures, this thing that has often been called the Old Testament. And it's not really that much old as in useless. It is old as in ancient, very ancient. It comes to us from approximately 2,000 years ago to about 3,500 years ago. The things that are written down in that Old Testament and those Hebrew scriptures come from various sources and traditions and cultures, and they were all fused together by various editors over time. Steve presented to you last week that Moses and the Exodus didn't quite happen that way. In fact, he talked about the Habaru, which sounds very much like Hebrew. And the Habaru were this people that the pharaohs actually wrote about in their writings that they struggled against. And so I'm going to take you through a little bit of a timeline here of where did Israel come from? Where did the Jewish people and their faith come from? 
We know from history in around 1290 BCE that a pharaoh was struggling with the Shashu. The Shashu is roughly translated wanderers. The wanderers. What's well, an interesting thing, and it's something that biblical scholars have uh, paid quite a lot of attention to, because these wanderers came in from the Sinai Desert, east of what is now modern-day Cairo and the Nile region. And they would, be in, they would raid in little, little parties. They would come in, maybe a group of 10 men or 20 men, and come in and raid different parts of civilization, essentially. Sometimes we don't think about these words like civilization, but civilization is a word that describes things that have been made orderly. Some sort of government, even if it's a rough government, was created in a village, in a town, in a city. There was a ruler of some sort or a group of rulers, and they had mighty men essentially around them, is what the Bible often calls these people. And they would protect that ruler and that ruler's flocks and herds and riches and people and all that sort of thing. And people would around the countryside would align themselves with different villages or city-states as they got larger. And so eventually you get a thing like the Egyptians and the Egyptian Empire, which was very small initially. And you get pharaohs who rule over the land. And then you have all of these people who live out in the desert who raid civilization. And the, and the Shashu were these wonders. And we wonder, where does our biblical stories come from? If Moses and the whole conquest of Canaan didn't actually happen that way, why are the stories there? And the stories are a shadow. They're bits and pieces passed down over centuries as to what actually happened. I have two examples in American culture. One is Plymouth Rock. Pilgrims came over on the Mayflower, right? They were fleeing England because of religious persecution, which is partially true, but most of them were merchants and were looking to make a buck, let's be honest, okay? They landed and supposedly landed on Plymouth Rock, right? Many of you have probably been to Plymouth Rock. You know, Plymouth Rock is a total hoax. I mean, these guys landed. It's cold. They're hungry. They're thirsty. You think they got out, stepped on a stone, and posed for a photo moment? The whole idea of Plymouth Rock developed 121 years after the event. A 93-year-old man said, my father told me about this rock out here, and that's the rock they landed on. Most likely he made it up. He just picked a rock. Lots of rocks around there. And then they etched in 1620 into the whole thing. And the rest is history, right? The pilgrims got together with the Indians. They all had a great little feast called Thanksgiving. And they got along ever after, right? I mean, that's the story we learn as kids in elementary school. And it's often the story that we carry on into our ideas of American beginnings, that somehow these English folk came over, landed, had a bunch of kids, and that's how we all ended up here. The problem is most of us aren't English, right? Most of us aren't from the pilgrims. We all got here in various other ways, and there's a whole lot of people who were here before the pilgrims. And yet that's the story of American beginnings. Second story is, I want, is from the American Revolution, is the ride of Paul Revere. Okay? The redcoats are coming. The redcoats are coming. Paul Revere probably didn't ride a horse. Paul Revere, the whole story did not happen in the way that we commonly tell it. And those stories are only just over 200 to 300 years old. Imagine before a a literate society came about, you go back 3,000 years ago, and people are telling stories from 500 to 1,000 years before that. And what happens to stories? And so you got people who are wandering around in the desert as wanderers, the Shashu, and they would raid the Egyptian civilization. And that turns into a story 
about there's a guy named Moses, and he led this people. He led this wandering people, wandering around the desert until eventually they came to the land of milk and honey, the land of Canaan, and they threw those idolatrous, sac- God-sacrificing people out of there and replaced it with their own. Because that's the story of the Bible right there. That's the stories that end up being there. Second story is from 1190 BCE, the Habaru, as Steve told you about last week, the Habaru that scholars think are now, became the Hebrews. They were mercenaries. They lived uh, in kind of the southern Israel slash Sinai area, and they were uh, basically a mercenary army, and they would align themselves with different city-states. And in our book of Numbers, you see the people of Israel and Moses aligning himself up with different city-states. And at some point, the city-states either make them mad or they do something that is considered to be godless and idolatrous or something, and then the people turn on them and just wander around the desert for 40 years. And you can see where those kinds of stories come from. Steve told you last week about this theory, this idea of the peasant revolt, that really Moses and the people didn't come and conquest Canaan. Told you about this idea that they were peasants who lived there in the culture and that they rose up, almost kind of like an Arab spring today. In some cases they were successful, in other cases they weren't successful. And the Bible tells it all as a morality tale. As long as they obeyed God, then everything went well. When they didn't obey God, things didn't go well. He also told you, I was going to share with you a different theory. And this is back to that whole wrestling with God. Steve and I have very different ideas as how Israel emerged, and he wanted me to tell you how I think it emerged today. And I just want to share with you that the majority of scholars today agree with my opinion. <laughs> you know? This is the theory that I was taught in seminary that you will read, and if you read scholarly accounts that you want to fall asleep at night, this is the thing you should read, as to how Israel and Judah emerged. And essentially it says they were Canaanites. These people that the Bible say they were raiding, really they were just a part of those people. And this goes along with world history. You've heard of the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. Right? You remember that a little bit from history class? Okay? Bronze and iron represent technological developments made with weaponry mostly. And how then an army could then use iron for various equipment and various weapons and they could create more of a civilization. They could organize more and then they have more strength and power and all those things. Well, during the Bronze Age, as we're merging out of this whole Pharaoh and the Habaru and all that, you have the hill country of Judah, which surrounds Jerusalem. The hill country to the west is kind of green, but it's very, very difficult terrain, mostly hills and mountains. And then to the east and south, it's all desert. Desert as far as you can see, hard rock desert. Not a great place to form a good economy. Up north in Israel, in Canaan, in Palestine, whatever you want to call it, is very lush, very fertile. They grow grapes and olives and all kinds of different things there. During this time, Canaan is situated between modern-day Turkey and modern-day Egypt, right? And it is a trade route for the entire ancient world. And Steve told you a little bit about this last week. And so different empires would come across and fight one another. So the Assyrians from the north, the Egyptians from the south, and the Babylonians from the east, they would all fight one another, not so much because they really cared about Israel or Judah or those people there, but they wanted to control the trade route. When you control the trade route, you control the commerce, you grow your empire. And so during this time... Different empires actually really controlled that region, but as a local person living in a city-state, you didn't really care about all of that. None of that was very important. You were just your people living around this city-state, and you knew about the people over there living near that city-state, and those people over there, 
and you called them all by their names, and they were different tribes, essentially. And so you have tribes like the Reubenites, and tribes like the Moabites, and tribes like the Jebusites, who lived around Jerusalem, and tribes like the Judites, eventually become Judah, all living around one another, all with some similar gods, plural, gods, plural, some with very different gods from one another, mostly speaking the same language, mostly using the same kinds of uh, cultural artifacts like pottery and, and those sort of things, but yet all different because it's not like today. They live in all these different city-states, the Bronze Age, a lot of struggling going on. And you've got these two places trying to emerge. And so Israel's emerging in the north, much more fertile, much more likely to grow an economy. And they emerge first. And eventually we get to a guy in the Bible named King Ahab. King Ahab is found in our world history record. King Ahab in the Bible is considered to be one of the most wicked, evil rulers that ever existed in Israel, and he led Israel astray and worshiping of idols and multiple gods and child sacrifice and all kinds of things. From the world history stage, he's one of the most successful local rulers that existed in, an, in a conflicting empire era. Ahab did a good job ruling his kingdom. And by having multiple gods and having the Israelites worship multiple gods, he created a better economy. Because not only were you going to sacrifice to Yahweh or Elohim, two different names of God in the Bible, you could sacrifice to Molech and this uh, Yam over here and Asherah over here and very similar gods. If you have to sacrifice all those people, right, it creates more flow of economy. And so he did really well, and he built all kinds of different walled cities and fortified cities and created an entire era of northern Israel's success for the next hundred years after him. And eventually, Israel was ruled by people who didn't do so well, and the Assyrians came in, got mad at them. They couldn't balance that political tie out, and the Assyrians came in and wiped out each one of those walled cities one by one by one and took people from northern Israel and spread them across the Assyrian Empire. And that was all destroyed. That allowed Judah, the southern tribe, the Davidic tribe where David is from, to emerge. And as Jerusalem becomes the, as Hebron actually, Hebron in the Bible becomes the city where David rules out of. And eventually, he takes over Jerusalem. And these two cities become, you know, decently well-off cities, but once the Assyrians wiped out northern Israel, these two cities become places of protection and commerce for that whole land area right there. And they begin to emerge. And as they begin to emerge, they want to assert their dominance over the northern half of Canaan, over the northern areas of Israel. And so they begin pushing their particular religious traditions and saying, you have to worship only the gods that exist in Jerusalem and Hebron. And you begin to see the development of the Jewish faith, of the Hebrew faith that we have inherited. Eventually, the Babylonian Empire conquered the Assyrians, and in uh, 586 B.C., they came in and leveled Jerusalem. And the Babylonians did this thing where they would take people from your homeland and transport them to other areas of the empire, and then they would transport people from the empire back into your homeland and mix all the people together. And as they mixed all together, you get all these different gods and religious traditions and cultural traditions and languages and stories. And they all began to mix together. And so you have stories that in the Bible, so we talk about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay? And those five books are what form the Torah, the main books of the Jewish faith, what become the foundation of the Christian faith. 
Well, those books are all made up of layers, all interwoven together of different stories. And we call it the documentary hypothesis, and Steve and I will get to that in a few weeks. But that whole idea gets all mixed together. And then when there's this group that comes back from, the Babylon, from Babylon during the Persian Empire, and they seek to purify Israel. And so they talk a lot about you have to be part of these certain 12 tribes. And you have to worship God only at Jerusalem. You can't worship God at any of the other cities across the place. And you have to do it in certain ways. And they're trying to purify Israel from all of the diversity. And that's how our Bible comes together. And eventually the Persians take over and the Greeks take over and eventually the Roman Empire and then you get into the time of Jesus. And this is what this looks like on a map. So going back to like the Bronze Age, going into the Iron Age, you have these various tribes and kingdoms all around. And eventually you get the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah and they emerge. And that is essentially our best guess of what that look like. And over on the far bottom left, you can see the Arabu tribes, which uh, kind of relates to that whole Habaru thing as well. And you see various kingdoms and various tribes, and they're all either, some of them are well-organized city-states, all in cooperation with one another, and some of them are just tribes that are kind of raiding out in the desert. Here you got the captivity routes as the Assyrians and the Babylonians took them out of their native lands and transported them across the various kingdoms. And then you have our story from the day. Jacob wrestles a man. And over and over and over again, the story says, and the man wrestled Jacob, and then the man asked Jacob, and the man said to Jacob, and then the man blesses Jacob. The man asks Jacob, Jacob, what is your name? He says, my name is Jacob. He says, no longer. No longer will you be known as Jacob. You will now be known as Israel, God wrestler. Or better translated, El wrestler. Israel. We make a huge mistake when we come to the Bible in English. We translate all these words as God. El is a name of a Canaanite deity, a Canaanite god. And it is used in the Bible, and we usually translate it as God. There's another name for God in the Bible. It is Yahweh. It's the holiest name in the Hebrew faith for God, and it is not to be said. It's actually uh, very bad for me to actually use the word Yahweh up here. Jewish people tend to be offended when you use the word Yahweh. It's so holy that it's not to be spoken. You have El, you have Yahweh, you have Elohim, which is kind of a plural big form of El, the God. You have Shaddai in the Bible, and that means a whole nother God. There's Baal in the Bible, which is often condemned throughout the Bible, but occasionally used for the God of Israel. You have El Yon, which is God most high, the, the, the highest God, almost like Zeus in the Greek pantheon. So you have all these different names of these people's gods. And you have these people that they talk about in their ancestry, people like Jacob, people like Isaac, people like Abraham, people like Israel. And as these people are all trying to figure out their phase, as they're blending together, they're blending their stories together as well so that the people who worship El or Elohim and the people who worship Yahweh begin to get together. And in our Bible, we even see this, that many times they are separated, but then you start seeing Scripture passages that are written later, and they start using them side by side. Elohim, Yahweh which in our, usually in our translations will read, God, my God. And we go, why are they repeating themselves that way? What's well, a bad translation? They're just saying, El Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim. They've, they've taken two gods and put them together as one. And they've blended their traditions and said, we know God like this. And they go, well, we know God like this. And they say, what if God is both? What if God is in your understanding and in my understanding? And they put them together and realize that you're not an enemy. You are not they. We are us. And we have 
similar ideas of God, and we can blend those things together and have a better, robust faith. And you can have a story about a guy named Jacob, and the other culture has a story about a guy named Israel. And so they have a story about, well, Jacob wrestled with this man, and he thought it was God, and he thought he'd come face to face with El. And El changed his name to Israel, the God wrestler. And rather than necessarily being confused and it's shaking our foundations, what it should do is inspire us. To say that as we learn about other people and their faith, that their faith and our faith can come together. And the whole thing is enriched by the coming together. That El and Yahweh can be blended together. And it becomes something way more important something that is life-changing and world-changing. And that is why we wrestle with God. We don't know who God is on our own. I can only know God through you. And you can only know God through me. If it's, I just rely on myself, I get this distorted peace of God. But when I encounter you, my whole world opens up. The story of God is one that has an entire history to it. In many ways, God was made up. And what I mean by that is we make up stuff about God in order to understand God. And that evolves through time as we all get together, as we learn more and understand more. And as we all share our perspectives, we go, oh, what if God is like this rather than that? What if God doesn't need animal sacrifices anymore? What if God would prefer us to just do good things to one another? And you see that trajectory in the Bible as you come out of the law and the kings and into the prophets. The prophets literally look at the people and say, God desires obedience over sacrifice. And then you get in the New Testament, and Jesus brings in this whole new thing where it's not even just about obedience anymore. It's not just follow God blindly. It's what are you going to do to love your brother and sister? What are you going to do to love your enemy? And that ark begins to increase as we move from God has this certain way of acting. If I sacrifice two or three sheep, then I'm in the good, to, well, if I just follow the laws perfectly, then I'm good, to, if I love other people, that is what is good. And the history of God begins to take shape until we get to where we're at today, where we know our brothers and sisters around the world of different faiths and philosophies and values, and we come together and we grow out of it. The people of Israel evolved out of the Canaanite culture, bringing their various traditions and stories together, and that became the religions of ancient Israel and Judah, and eventually some of that makes it into the Bible as that advances through the years. They all had different gods. El, who was married to Asherah, and there's places even in our Old Testament, our Hebrew scriptures, where God does have a wife named Asherah. And then there's a whole bunch that says, that's not supposed to be the way it is, and they condemn it all. And they have children, Yahweh and Baal and other heavenly hosts. And this is part of the Canaanite pantheon, just like there's a Greek pantheon with Zeus and Hera and all of their brothers and sisters and children. And this is where the Hebrew culture emerges out of. In some ways, that freaks us out. But another way, it gives new inspiration and new form to our faith. It allows us to wrestle and struggle and say, God might not be exactly the way my parents said God was. Maybe there's something that Bev here can bring to my faith or something that Susan there can bring to my faith or something that any of you out there bring to my faith that changes what I grew up on. Our faiths become something 
amazing as we tell our various stories together. What story are you telling about your faith? What story are you going to tell about your life? What story does Columbine United Church share? Is it one of uniformity? Is it one where we all have to believe the same way? Or do you go out and tell people, you know what? I'm going to take your faith and my faith, and we're going to see how they intermingle. and See what comes out of that. See what kind of world comes out of that. See how that changes my life and your life and the entire world. We wrestle with God here at Columbine. We believe it is good. We believe that it is in the best traditions of the ancient peoples. And I hope as you go out the doors this morning that you know that it is okay to be confused. It is okay to struggle. It is okay to say, here's what I believe right now, but I hope to believe something different tomorrow. Let us pray. God, you have gone by many names throughout history and in our time now. Some of us call you God, generically. Some of us think you are the one or energy. Some of us call you Jesus Christ. Remind us Oh God, that you show up to us in many forms, in many ways, and that none of us can dictate our idea of you and say, this is it. You are infinite, and we are incomplete. You are vast, and we only understand so much. Remind us that we are your children that we are loved by you and we are supposed to spread that love to all people and share our stories together. God, this morning all around the world there is conflict around religion, around truth, around faith. May we stop looking at our conflicts as battles to be won and inspire us to dialogue with one another as people who can improve ourselves with one another. And God, all along, you've been teaching us that this is the kind of faith that we're supposed to have, and you even taught it to us in a prayer, reminding us that the heavens do come to earth. And so we pray that prayer now. Thank